Hello, everyone. It's Francis Widowson here. Welcome to the Rational Space Disputations. And for people who are unaware of the format of the disputations, uh, what I do is I invite a guest on, someone who I find their work I find to be interesting or uh, I admire uh, in the academic context usually. And this, mor this morning we have um, someone who I am interested, very interested in their ideas and I admire at the same time. One of my favorite colleagues at Mount Royal University, uh, Dr. Sinclair McRae and Sink as he is called at Mount Royal. And Sink is a philosophy professor in the Department of Humanities at Mount Royal University. He has many interesting philosophical pieces. Um, what we're gonna talk about today mostly is to do with the Society for Academic Freedom and Scholarship articles, which are quite accessible and I highly recommend them. But I also admire Sink a great deal because he is one of the few academics out there who is trying to take on some of the difficulties that we're facing with respect to academic freedom and freedom of expression in universities. So uh, welcome, Sink, to Rational Space Disputations. Thanks, Francis, and thanks for that kind, uh, I guess, uh, introduction as well. Uh, thanks also for having me. Yes, you're, you're, it's great. And we've been trying to do this for quite a while. It's just that Sink, of course, has been busy with uh, marking and all sorts of things. So um, for people who are unaware of the format of the Rational Space Disputations, what we do is we have an hour where I ask the guest questions. And then after an hour, we turn the screens so that the guests uh, can ask me questions. And it's an interesting format, which allows for um, things that are, were left out to be covered and as well um, you know, writes any possible power imbalances that might be in effect. So um, before we start, Sink, I, I think it might be helpful to the audience if you just tell us a little bit about yourself, tell us what you're currently working on, tell, you, tell us what your interests are, just so that people who are not familiar with your work can understand uh, what you're all about. Well, I'm a professional philosopher. I've been working at Mount Royal uh, University in Calgary, uh, like Francis said, in the humanities department for the past 25 years. Uh, my background is I went to Queen's University, Dalhousie for my MA, and the University of Toronto for my PhD. Uh, my area of expertise is what's known as axiology, which is the study of value, and that has four component parts, uh, ethics, uh, prudential value or welfare or well-being, good for individuals, happiness theory, that sort of thing, aesthetics, and also perfectionist value. Uh, so within that frame, uh, I teach a number of different courses and my research and service work is also connected to those things. And I guess I became more relevant for this discussion, um, especially interested in topics of academic freedom, although I've been interested in those for years, but especially in the last, uh, I guess, maybe four or five years, maybe maybe five years. Um, and I've just become uh, more, I've been gravitating more and more to trying to understand and also to respond to uh, the serious challenges that we're facing within academia. And to that end, um, I, I do service work related to this and also now my research is is swinging over in, in that direction as well. And I'm just working on some, some articles on academic freedom uh, this spring. So I have to carry on with that. But that's basically what I'm up to. Excellent. And you just mentioned um, quite a complex idea, which I'm somewhat familiar with, but it would be maybe helpful to hear a little bit more about it. Um, you mentioned uh, what you call, or what's called axiology. And then you said that that encompasses four things. Ethics was one of them. Um, aesthetics, that was another. What were the two other ones that you had uh, you'd included within that? Yeah, the main one is, val is, uh, is welfare or questions about uh, well-being, the nature of the good life. Uh, that's a question in axiology. And also questions about perfectionist value are also questions that fall within the domain of axiology. So 
I teach a range of courses, social and political philosophy, ethics, applied ethics, professional ethics, uh, logic, uh, history of philosophy, a whole bunch of courses. When you work at a smaller institution, you have broader in interests. And um, mm. uh, so, so yeah, my, I, have, I bring a particular um, expertise in professional ethics to bear on these questions. I'm the author of our our faculty associations ethics code, for example, and uh, yeah. lately I've been thinking more seriously about the failings of professional ethics among those mm. who um, are subverting the promotion of the values that justify the university. Mm. Yes, and that is going to be a major topic uh, that we were, are going to be looking at. So, how would you define ethics? So, broadly, ethics is concerned with the study of the relations between individuals looked at from a, a normative or evaluative perspective. So I, I'm a, what's called a welfareist. I believe the point or purpose of ethics is to promote the good of those beings that have a good of their own or potentially have a good of their own. And this commitment to welfareism, I think, also grounds empirically questions about justice and questions about ethics involving our personal lives as well. So I think there are truths and facts about uh, what makes life go well and uh, I'm you know I've been interested in studying that for for many years now. Mm, yes and um, are ethics this like I you often hear morals ethics those two words are used uh, together or like as synonyms mm -hmm. yeah. how, how are those how are how is morality different from ethics in your view? So that's changed over time. Uh, nowadays, uh, I just tell my students that I'm going to use those words interchangeably and that our focus will be on examining the basically the, the rightness and wrongness, good, goodness and badness, virtue and viciousness of uh, human relations, um, but also the relations between humans and other non-human animals as well. Okay. Um, and I notice in your many of your articles, you have sentience. Mm -hmm as one of the things you mentioned, and potentially sentient. Just right. you include those together. So, uh, and so uh, from what I understand, your, your idea of the good life is something that enhances the welfare of sentient and potentially sentient beings. Is that correct? Yes. So yeah, there's a conceptual question. If you divide the universe up into those things that can be the ex experiencing subjects of a life or not. So this pencil doesn't count and potentially it doesn't count either, but Francis, you do count. Mm -hmm. Now the question is once we've identified the beings that can potentially receive consideration from others, what consideration should we give them? Uh, that's really it. now we're asking an ethical question. The previous question is more like a conceptual question. Mm -hmm. it's, it distinguishes <clears throat> welfare is perspectives on ethics from perspectives like um, uh, you know, uh, holism in, in, in environmental philosophy. The notion that we have responsibilities to aspects of the environment that just doesn't make any sense if they can't be the receiving subjects of some sort of experience. On the other hand, if you can experience your life, then you are morally considerable how much consideration you should receive is always going to depend on the circumstances, going to be complex and nuanced. But this way of <clears throat> identifying the field really just identifies the area or the individuals within that area about whom we should be talking about. Okay, that's then, and that's that's interesting about the holism because it, it's interesting to think. Okay, sentience um, that's going to be how we're going to be considering the good life is is that that kind of. Uh, value system which is concerned about those beings that are sentient or potentially sentient whereas if it's not sentient trees for example although I don't know like there are some it's interesting kind of discussions about whether nobody's trees home. what's that sorry nobody's home there I don't <laughs> have any obligations to prepare it yeah so but I but but once we determine, so there might be de like that's kind of the quest: is it sentient or or possibly sentient? And if it is, then it's going to be within the rubric of consideration for determining increasing welfare for 
those elements. That's right. Yeah. So I think of sentience as a kind of minimum entry point. Uh, either there's somebody home or not. And that's also the defining factor that uh, identifies welfare itself. So mm -hmm. you have to be the experiencing subject of a life or potentially the experience of subject of a life <clears throat> in order for you to have welfare. But a tree doesn't have welfare. It does have instrumental value for sentient creatures, um, yeah. but it has no good of its own. So the word good is ambiguous and we have to be careful in how we use it when we're talking about these kinds of questions. So a tree might have perfectionist value. It could be a good instance of its kind. It could yeah, have a yeah. value. It could be a beautiful tree. Um, and it could have ethical value for others, but it has no prudential value. Nobody's home there. Mm. So um, it's just a starting point. Once we get past the question of sentience, then a host of other really interesting questions about what makes our lives valuable <clears throat> enter the picture. And yeah. like I said, I'm, um, I'm an objectivist about this. Uh, so I believe that there are facts about what make our lives go well, even though I think it's also importantly relative to the perspective of the subject whose life it is uh, that helps determine that. And uh, that's an important dividing point between relativists and, and non-cognitivists non on one side and <clears throat> cognitivists on the other. So uh, that puts me, I think, firmly in the camp of science when it comes to ethics. And I think one thing people struggle with when, we're, when they're talking about value theory, ethics, and questions of justice are questions about the empirical basis of the judgments we make in these areas. And there's often, there've been many in the history of philosophy, many challenges uh, to the empirical basis of ethical claims. And uh, that's also a, uh, an issue that divides and debates about academic freedom as well. Yeah, and, and um, I, when you were talking, I was just reminded of, of Bertrand Russell. So I, I was quite taken, and I still am, I guess, uh, when I first heard Bertrand Russell's um, quadrant. It's it's what it's the quadrant that he developed, um, which was um, you have facts and you have values, and the the facts. So that's kind of the truth and falsity, mm -hmm. and then the values, which is um, good and bad. Um, the the facts and and or that's a relatively easy kind of thing to, to get your head around, except for, you know, scientific epistemology, I guess is, is what it involves. Um, but then with respect to the, the values, he argued um, his, his way of saying good or bad was inspired by love, was his, how he determined that, which meant, um, basically cooperation i guess was how he determined that so he his his idea was of the good life was knowledge that was inspired by love and then you could have three other possibilities where you would have love that was inspired by by falsity so for example he gives the example of you know uh, religious people in the Middle Ages who thought in order to help people to survive the plague, they should come into the church and pray. Mm -hmm. But of course, that was inspired not by knowledge because it was false. So what happened was everyone came into the churches and spread plague around mm -hmm. everything else. Um, and then you have sort of the scenarios like... Um, uh, one of them would have been like in the 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 falsity and I guess uh, well he's saying love so I guess it would be hate and fault and falsity which would be um, kind of a I, I I can't remember the examples here but mm -hmm. then one would be sort of the the psycho psychopathic type of thing where you have someone who has a lot of knowledge but they don't use that for benefit for humans they they use that for their own selfish so selfishness versus kind of altruism these sorts of things were kind of what R russell was getting at do you think that is uh, like how does that coincide with your how does russell's position coincide with your own position so i'm a pluralist when it comes to questions about sources of value i believe that there are that 
the question of human well-being is overdetermined. that there are ways and ways that our lives can go well and that there are various different sources of intrinsic value uh, that can make our lives go well. So I frame this in terms of uh, three dimensions of rationality. So I think of rationality as having three component parts. Epistemic rationality, we generally want to promote and cultivate beliefs that track the truth about the world. Axiologic rationality is a rationality with respect to the values that we go for. So I think some values are, as a matter of fact, better than other values. For example, values that are not subject to hedonic adaptation, such as self-acceptance, love to take that example, community involvement, the pursuit of knowledge, <clears throat> excuse me, those are all examples of values that, that are not restricted, that, that are not subject necessarily anyway to hedonic adaptation. Uh, in comparison to the pursuit of wealth and the pursuit of fame and popularity, those are also values and sources of welfare, but they're subject to hedonic adaptation, so I argue that they're not as good. Uh, and also uh, uh, instrumental rationality is the third part. It's not enough to know the truth about the world or to cultivate beliefs that track the truth about the world or, or to have values that actually would promote your authentic happiness. But you actually have to do things as well. So you have to bridge the divide between knowing and doing in order to demonstrate instrumental rationality. So um, I'm a pluralist about value. Uh, I think there are many different sources of intrinsic value uh, that make our life worth living. And I don't privilege any of those mm. um, because I think that we're different. I mean, I, I truly believe uh, it's an article of faith that we have free will and that we're different people and that what makes our life go well uh, must refer to the perspective of the person whose life it is. And if you take seriously the idea that we're different, uh, then that means that we cannot prescribe for others how they should live their lives. Uh, because each person needs to have freedom to discover and execute their own plans in life uh, and to live their own authentic best life. Mm. So that was quite com complex, uh, but there, there seemed to be three things that you identified as part of, I think, part of values, right? It was one was epistemic, is that correct? Well, it's, it's part of rationality. So rationality, I, I, okay, so that's the larger. So rationality, epistemic rationality, and then something to do with values and rationality, and then the instrumental, which I assume is a means end type of, of type of relationship. Is how, right. does one, how does one have this effect? Um, and what is the sec? I don't quite understand the second one. So first of all, values. sorry, Francis. So first of all, rationality is something that I understand for an individual in terms of authentic happiness, uh, living a life that delivers authentic happiness. And the three component parts are epistemic rationality. So we need to cultivate habits of acquiring beliefs that track the truth about the world. And we also need to have axiologic rationality. So axiologic rationality refers to the rationality of the values that we endorse and pursue in our life. And instrumental rationality refers to bridging the gap between knowing and doing. It's actually putting into action yeah. uh, the, our beliefs about the world and the, the values that we want to pursue. And I guess it's the second one that I have the most trouble with. Uh, sure. I'm not sure if I'm unique in that. <laughs> is that um, you have value, rash, some values are rational. Yes. And what, how do we determine between rational values and irrational values? Well, that's a complicated question. Okay. Uh, first, just to, if you think about the, so one of my views is that, um, is that we have underappreciated and underemphasized in education, the importance of values education, of axiology. Mm. So if you think about the dominant model of education for young people, it really is focused on the acquisition of knowledge. Mm. And although there's nothing wrong with that, I support yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. That that's happened at the expense of, mm. uh, or in, in, without sufficient regard for attention to the values that we should consciously cultivate and pursue in life. In fact, my own view about education is that most of the, I, I, I don't know most, but much of the value that students obtain through going to school is really reduced to 
self-regarding and other regarding virtues that they cultivate through the process of going to school as opposed to the facts they remember from going to school. Mm. Um, you know, my mission sort of as an educator is one of them anyways, is to emphasize and promote the importance of values education among my students because uh, my experience is they don't think very well about this. They don't mm. have a lot of experience with this. But they don't have any background or much background uh, dealing with these kinds of questions. And I only get them for 13 weeks. So my job really is to raise a bunch of questions and to try to stimulate them to do some more reading about these topics. But yeah, I think some values are better than others. I mean, think about smoking. Um, smoking is pretty much the worst thing you can do for your health generally as a habit that we f- formulate. People derive value from smoking. Is that a good value? Well, I just said, it's not for me to judge what is good for other people. But we can say, that doesn't mean we can't say anything. We can still say from, even with that, that restriction, some values deliver authentic happiness and other values don't. A good example is the pursuit of wealth for its own sake. Um, studies have shown that pursuing money for its own sake leads to a, basically hedonic adaptation. So people do not derive the same benefit from that pursuit over time as they do from, say, the pursuit of knowledge for its own sake. Um, I read once that Erasmus was the last person who'd read everything. I mean, I'm not going to live long enough to read the books that I still want to read that I haven't read yet, let alone all the ones that will be written and I haven't discovered yet. I know. Yeah, the pursuit of knowledge is intrinsically valuable and engaging. So I'm not going to get bored reading. I'm not going to get bored studying. Yeah. Uh, that, that's a value that is not subject to hedonic adaptation. You don't adapt uh, to that kind of growth in your life. And the same thing goes for self-acceptance. If you see yourself as a dynamic individual, constantly growing, uh, then life has many opportunities and possibilities for further growth. It doesn't get boring. I, I really don't think I've been bored since the 1970s. Yeah, no, that's, and that's something I think people should think about and that, that's an interesting way to put it, which I, I hadn't thought of before, is that there's a tendency to argue that something has no value as opposed to it has value, but is the value beneficial or does it increase human welfare? So, um, you know, people going shopping yeah. to buy things, which is I know is a is a pursuit that many people have that they do, they're not doing it because they've got to go and get a you know some food or something like that they're doing it just as entertainment and how does that like although that's that has value for them is that something that's satisfying i guess to them it's sort of the way i think i think that's sort of how you're looking at it yeah and one interesting way of parsing this is by drawing the distinction between system or type one thinking and system or type two thinking. Yes. Um, Kistanovich has this great book called The Robot's Rebellion, Making Sense of Meaning in the Life of Darwin or the Age of Darwin. I forget the subtitle. Yeah. You, you can see a number of the values that people pursue are directly connected to advancing the interests of our genes, uh, not the interests of ourselves. So I don't think of myself as my system one perspective on the world. I think of myself as my system two perspective. So um, the classic example of defeating the interests of our genes is using a prophylactic during sex. So if the, yeah. if the, if the reason for system one life is to per- perpetuate our genes consciously, yeah, it's system two thinking. So I try to connect up arguments about the differences in the benefits that we receive from the things that we pursue, the values that we go for in terms of a personal account of personal identity and a character-based account of personal identity, actually, that is really grounded in system two. So the examples that I gave previously, they really are anchored in system two, not system one. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like I think of consumerism, I kind of define consumerism as the irrational pursuit of the consumption of goods at the expense of other goods in life. Um, and there's a long story there. I'm happy to talk about it, but but uh, it's you cannot see that as delivering on the interests of uh, of a person understood from the perspective of their reason, system two thinking or type two thinking. Mm. That really is grounded in system one life, and really it's just like the controversies going on in universities now. You can see the debates in terms of this distinction between 
a tribal system one thinking, us versus them, and system two thinking, and arguably uh, the triumph of reason, which you know is not happening right now, uh, mm -hmm. is really dependent upon developing things like compromise and cooperation and developing systems of cooperation that exceeds the capacity of our ability to cooperate from our system one perspective. So it's a complicated story, but pretty interesting. Still working on yeah, it. Yeah, well, I was just thinking when you were you were talking about that, um, and this is a part of historical materialism, which is the, the perspective that I'm particularly interested in. Um, there's the idea of the species being that that's something that that was put forward as kind of the the final, I guess, achievement of humanity uh, is to uh, so you have tribalism that is the sort of this uh, system one that would be a system one kind of like you're you are from an evolutionary perspective are designed to protect your closest relatives uh, that that's something that would be hardwired into people generally but as part of the system two kind of dynamic we we learn gradually to expand our our cooperation to encompass larger and larger groups and, and that as well had an evolutionary advantage because those that could expand beyond the small group would have a larger group with which to you know compete against other other groups and then we have development of nations which is like a uh, still you have the kind of identities in other nations but you you're you, you have a kind of almost an invented type of um uh association with people and uh, uh and then we have the possibility i'm not sure if this is actually true or not of becoming seeing yourself as part of the human species uh is that does is that uh do you think that that's true or do you do, what's your thoughts on that uh, that that possible evolutionary development sure it's possible it's aspirational it's mm -hmm. connected to the it, it's also connected to the role of reason in the story of our you know our story of justice and the story of our welfare as well yep. uh, and it's really uh, i mean it, it's it's connected to the justification for the university the social justification for our university is to promote the pursuit of truth and the advance, advancement of knowledge. And it, it, that is, you know, that's a sort of foundational question. Do you believe in that or not? Uh, I think many of the people who are subverting the path of the promotion of education in our society do not believe that. No. That's a dividing line that tells the, tells the story, really. So I'm an objectivist about the truth. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I'll take an easy example. The question of the number of objects on my desk is an empirical question not determined by what we agree about. It's also not determined by my personal subjective view about this matter. It's mm -hmm. a fact about the world. Now that's an example that's friendly to my argument, but I think that there are also arguments like that that lead into the domain of questions about justice and ethics as well. Um, mm -hmm. And it's ultimately grounded in the belief in welfareism, that there are some things that make our lives go better than, uh, than other things, and the ones that make our lives go better are the ones that we should pursue. Consider a good example of this I haven't mentioned, which is the question of the meaningfulness of our life is determined by the impact we have on the good of other sentient and potentially sentient beings. And that impact is quantifiable. It's something that we can measure. Some lives are more meaningful than others. And insofar as our lives are made meaningful by promoting the good of those beings that have a good of their own others, then our life is also, as a matter of fact, it's, it's more authentically happy as we pursue those kinds of goods. And notice the pursuit of the meaningfulness of our life is not grounded in system one. So it's not connected to the experience of pleasure, for example. Pleasure mm -hmm. is basically a mechanism to try to get us to promote the interests of our genes. Evolutionarily speaking, that's why it's there. Mm -hmm. basically yes so what's your view on beauty do you think that beauty like that's kind of always for me has been a i don't quite it's something i don't quite understand how that fits in with all this because i have heard people say you know the university is about the pursuit of truth and the um teaching people to and i think uh, it was um finkelstein norman finkelstein who said uh 
you know, my approach to education is like Plato's, I teach my students to love what is beautiful or something like that, um, which I thought was a very strange turn of phrase, which I don't quite understand. Um, like, what do you see beauty as part? Where does beauty fit within this? Or what's like, this is something that I've never really quite understood very well. So, yeah, I'll give you the philosopher's answer. Yeah. So we often use language figuratively or non literally. Mm. And he is one of the main candidates for that. So often people are speaking metaphorically, non literally, yes. yeah. when they talk about beauty. Yeah. So, Dahl, for example, said beauty is the promise of happiness. I can give that a literal and a non-literal interpretation. In, in aesthetics, in the, in the aesthetics includes beauty as what we call an inflector. Sublimity is another example. So there has been a bias towards interpreting and studying aesthetics from the perspective of the beautiful. But often when people talk about beauty, they're not speaking literally. They're speaking figuratively or metaphorically. And then of course, the, the problem with that then is getting a handle on what exactly they're talking about. As soon as you start speaking figuratively or metaphorically, precision goes out the window. And now we have to struggle to try to make sense of what it is we're saying to each other. So if you're talking about beauty understood within the domain of aesthetics, it is an inflector. It's a way that we assess or appraise art. But you know, although there's been a sort of a historical dominance of beauty over the history of Western aesthetics, mm. that's, a bit of an, that's a bit of an exaggeration. There definitely has been a, an emphasis on that. It's out of whack with what really makes art. Um, it, it's, it's too limiting a story of the value of art um, and the nature of art as well. It's one part of that story for sure, uh, mm. but it's only, it's only a part. It's, in our culture, it has a outsized a purchase on people's thinking about aesthetics. Um, yeah, whereas yeah. I would think meaningfulness, for example, would be something that is um, underappreciated in the story of art. I mean, when I watch a moody, sorry, when I watch a movie, I'm interested in engaging in analysis. I'm interested in art mm -hmm. criticism because the art criticism recovers the meaningfulness of it that makes the experience of it and also the interpretation of it uh, so much more valuable. Um, so beauty is just one part of the story. Yeah, well, I, I, I've often had conversations with, like, because I'm not, I'm more of a rationalist. I've kind of got rationality more than understanding art or anything like that. And art can be ugly. Absolutely. So, like, some people see art, it has to be, if it's not beautiful, it's not, <laughs> it's not art. It's, you know, but art can be ugly. Like, you know, Picasso comes to mind as someone who, like he's trying to communicate. Uh, do you think that art is um, communicating through the emotions? Another complicated question, big topic. Um, well, and so it can be either like ugliness, communicating through ugliness or communicating through beauty, but you're still communicating and you're still, you know, providing meaning and so on and, and you know, helping people understand things, but it doesn't have to be, you know, in this kind of whatever, well, beauty, I guess, I, I don't know exactly even what we're talking about. Like, how do we know something is beautiful um, or not um, is another question, but still the emotion, it seems to me that art is within the realm of, of the emotions as opposed to the intellect. So uh, I would like, judge in terms of that, but yeah. So yeah. I would narrow it down a little bit more, Francis. So mm -hmm. uh, one of his books, uh, actually my favorite book, The Transfiguration of the Commonplace, Arthur Danto has a thought experiment. And he says, imagine there's a group of people who can only see things literally. Uh, that is, they have no philosophy. They have no theory, uh, no meta theory about the world. So no self-consciousness self about, they have no system for communicating, for example, um, uh, that is using symbols and no awareness of the idea of something representing something else. He calls these people barbarians in his, in his thought experiment. And he asks the question from their perspective, what would the domain of art include? And he argues that from their perspective, the domain of art would be necessarily limited to perceptual qualities of the things that we see. So they might identify as beautiful those perceptually uh, appealing properties that they see in the world. But that basically leaves out all of the meaningfulness we attach 
uh, to the things that we interpret as works of art. And that includes what you're just talking about as uh, so-called ugly art. So mm -hmm. uh, I think of it as restricted to merely the perceptual qualities. And although there's value in that, for sure, think about a beautiful sunset, uh, mm -hmm. the domain of art goes far, far beyond that. And the value of art goes far, far beyond that as well. And it's not available, again, to people who only see the world literally, who cannot interpret what it is they're seeing and appreciate its meaningfulness, for example. Mm. So you see yourself as an objectivist, I believe you, you said. Um, we seem to be moving away from that in the universities. <laughs> is, that, is that a problem in your view? Like, is, there, is it possible to have the university which is not, doesn't have an objectivist kind of character to it? Is that where we've gone wrong, I guess? Like, you know, we are going to, I think both you and I will, you know, are in agreement that things have started to go terribly wrong. Is the kind of the, the movement away from the objectivist viewpoint, is that, was that, is that part of the problem? Yeah, you know, if I had to isolate one factor, that would be <laughs> it. That would be it. Um, so, yeah. so here's the way that I frame it. Um, still in our society, universities, colleges, higher education is socially justified to the extent to which it promotes the pursuit of truth and knowledge. And you either believe that or you don't. So there's been a movement for at least 60 years or so from people like Foucault and Marcuse. Yep. Uh, the, now we're in later uh, postmodernism. Uh, and th that view, I think, is essentially grounded in the denial of the objectivity of truth and the objectivity of facts about the world. Yep. And once that notion that knowledge is socially constructed gains hold, then that's at odds with, that is incompatible with the justifying values of the university. So I, I realize it's just a contingent historical fact that these are the values that we have. But as a defender of reason and as a promoter of liberalism broadly understood uh, and enlightened, the Enlightenment project and rationalism, uh, I think that's a good thing. So really, this is the dividing line. And I, I frame this in, lots of, in a number of different ways. So mm. you know, people like Foucault and Marcuse argue that, that, that knowledge is socially constructed and uh, they reject the Enlightenment project of engaging in the regulated marketplace of ideas uh, through disputation to try to get a better sense of what the truth and what, what the facts are. From, if, you think of, if you think of epistemology from this political perspective, then I think what you're committed to is the idea that you don't want to engage in disputation with people who disagree with you if they occupy a different power position. And the other part of that story that they tell is that that those who push the Enlightenment project that I'm supportive of occupy positions of power that make, that make it self-defeating to engage in dialogue with such people. So uh, the idea is that, that, that it's self-defeating to engage in rational debate with people who occupy positions of hegemony or political power in society. And that the only way to do this is to subvert it basically that's really the goal it's not it's not to contest it it's if you so here's here's a way that i that i sort of try to try to clarify things a little bit there's a process product distinction here so i'm in favor of fair and due process regardless of your political beliefs so there's lots of space on the political spectra for people to disagree about questions about conflicts of interest regarding values, which is basically how I understand politics. Within that domain though, all those people are committed to this objectivist view that there is a truth to be discerned and that, that there are facts about the world, that there's knowledge that we can obtain, that there is some sort of independent touchstone against which we can assess progress and the, the arguments that we each have. As soon as you give that up, uh, now the whole project of pursuing truth and objective knowledge is out the window. And now it's just a power struggle. So my, my complaint or disagreement 
with, um, they're called different things, um, progressive orthodoxy, um, uh, colloquially, colloquially called the woke, um, critical theory. You ideologues. use the word, so I believe, critical theory extremist. Yeah, so the reason, so that sounds like a pejorative, um, but, but I, I think of it actually as a commitment to a different political and worldview. So I, I think of them as dogmatists, ideologues, extremists, and uh, subversives, actually. So the question is whether or not you accept uh, the social mission of the university, which is the promotion of truth and the pursuit of facts and knowledge. Do you accept that or not? This really is the dividing line. And at this level, we're really talking about our ultimate commitments here, our, our fundamental or foundational commitments. And it's, it is a question of epistemology. And I, I'm committed to the view that there's a world independent of my experience of it. Mm -hmm. And facts about that world are not determined by my perception of it or the perception of other people in my group. I do understand that reality is, is mediated by our perceptual apparatus and also by our cognitive scheme. So I don't think I'm naive about that. But ultimately, I, you know, this is a commitment that I can't prove. Um, but ultimately, I'm committed to the idea that there's a world independent of us. And it seems to me that critical theory ideologues reject that worldview, uh, that they think of knowledge as being socially constructed, not ultimately anchored in some independent reality. Hence, the idea of science as reality-based inquiry. I'm a proponent of science. I believe that the goal of science basically is to serve as a social antidote to confirmation bias. And it can only fulfill that function if there's a truth about the world that we're trying to understand. So, so for me, the, you know, I have that argument that I, I think that academic freedom does not protect subversion. And this is, <laughs> this, is, this, is you're, you're, this is where I wanted to go with this. So this is great because yeah, this, this is, this is a, a point of, so uh, Mark Mercer, who I've had on this program, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm still a little bit not sure where I stand on this question, which is, you know, how the university should respond to relativism, I guess, or maybe not relativism, but relativists. So that's kind of seems to me the crucial issue here. It, and like we have relativists who were, were not demanding that relativism be the position accepted by everyone. That was originally how relativism kind of got its way in to the university, was just by being another perspective, which was, um, I kind of consider it a bit of a, you know, head fuck. Like it was kind of a head fuck that was going on, which, you know, was kind of interesting. Um, and, and then when it got in there, it started because it undermined the objective kind of paradigm. Mm -hmm. It was able to just wreak havoc on the university. Like that seems to me to be what's happened. I don't know what to do about this because I, on the one hand, and this is sort of Mercer's position, you, you wanna have an openness of things and you don't wanna have, you know, the purging, if we're gonna use that term of, of, of groups of people within the university and so on. But on the other, we have a situation where, and I think this is your position, where it, it's making it impossible for the universe. That's kind of its, if, if it is true, that it is, that's its kind of nature is to destroy. So like, I, I'm not sure what to think about this, whether you can have the relativist kind of position as one position amongst a number uh, or whether the relativist position is inherently destructive. Having it there is destructive to the university. And I just thought, may, was wondering how you kind of, I know you probably coming down on the relativist position being inherently destructive, it seems to me, but I'm so, wondering if I've got that right. Yeah, so I would distinguish between the ideas that we can study and the ideas that we can entertain. And absolutely, relative, I mean, I teach relativism, but it's something that we yeah. should definitely talk about. Yeah. There's a difference between the study of 
uh, questions about relativism, moral non-cognitivism, uh, objectivity, subjectivity, very slippery terms, a very complicated area. I think people need to work through these ideas and the university is the place for doing that. But I would draw a distinction between the study of these ideas and the political application of them uh, as decided. And that's where the subversion comes in. So mm -hmm. I, I don't think of the, I don't think of, of, of knowledge as being basically a representative of power hierarchies, for example. I think that there's an independent truth about the world. And that goes as much for individual well-being as it does for facts about the world as well. So again, the distinction that I want to draw is between the domain, the areas that we should be free to study, which include these areas, mm -hmm. and and the activist, uh, the activist program. Mm -hmm. So here, I think of I think of education itself as a political act. Mm -hmm. Becoming educated is is a political act, uh, but activism that subverts the fundamental uh, um, justification, social justification of the university is subversive and subversion in this form should not be tolerated. So the, the difference here is what you do in the classroom or what you do in the journals or what you do when you're re researching and studying and the actions that you perform. So I guess another way of framing this is, I think that you should be free to study what you want in the context of higher education, in the pursuit of knowledge and in the pursuit of truth. But subverting those goals is not licensed by the justification for the institution in the first place. And acts of subversion are acts that, well, they're, they're acts that undermine the promotion of those values and that make possible the production of knowledge in higher education. From society's perspective, universities are valuable insofar as People who work within them, students, professors, are free to pursue the truth and knowledge about the world. And that's what I was saying before about that process product distinction. Mm -hmm. So the question is, in your process, are you committed to the values of pursuing truth and knowledge or not? That is the question. Now, when it comes to the content as opposed to the process, you're free to believe whatever you want to believe. And in the regulated marketplace of ideas, it's up to you to show that the beliefs that you hold are ones that have merit, but they can only have merit relative to a standard that people within the system must accept. So I don't think of it as oppressive or coercive but to insist that there has to be some sort of independent standard against which we measure success, what makes one idea better than another idea. I think that is the basic starting point for the whole project. So again, it's a subtle distinction, but the distinction is this. We should be committed in the process uh, to um, playing by the same set of rules that justify the university in the first place, which is the pursuit of knowledge and the pursuit of truth. But in on the content side, the beliefs that we actually have, go for it. You can believe whatever you want. And again, ultimately, the test of merit in the regulated marketplace of ideas is whether you can defend those ideas and against what? How do we measure whether one view is better than another? The difference between an ideologue and an intellectual is that an intellectual believes that ideas should be based, should be assessed and accepted on the basis of their merits, regardless of their political implications. I, I try to go where the truth takes me. In mm -hmm. contrast, ideologues invert that. And what they say is that beliefs should be accepted for their political consequences or because of their political nature independently of their merits as ideas. And that really is the difference. Are you an ideologue or are you an intellectual? I understand that I'm, that I'm emphasizing a gross distinction here. And I'm not saying that people are either one or the other, um, but we need clear concepts with which to think. But the real world is of course way more nuanced than this, but this is a dividing line. Are you committed as a matter of process to the project of the enlightenment and the process of liberalism widely understood? which is the justification for the university, or uh, do you want to subvert that? In other words, do you think that you should not be engaging in rational disputation with people who disagree with you if they occupy higher positions or perceived higher positions in the social hierarchy? Uh, you can't have it both ways. So um, I think that uh, it's academic freedom should not be used as a protection for people who are subverting 
the fundamental values that make the process work. At the process level, you have to be committed or you're out. Why would you think, here, let me, let me frame the argument from a different perspective. So I, I do professional ethics. And in the field of professional ethics, if you look at doctors, lawyers, accountants, other professionals, what are the grounds under which we're justified in sanctioning them? Um, either some sort of uh, official reprimand or in the extreme case where, they're, um, uh, where they lose their, their jobs. There are two kinds of reasons, really. One is competence and the other one is corruption or serious wrongdoing. Well, how does that translate to the uh, university field, higher education? People have confused the notion of tenure with a license to say and do whatever you want. And if you have a community that supports that, then that basically licenses that kind of action. But that's consistent with being an ideologue. And it's also consistent with the project of cancel culture, which is what we're witnessing happening right now. In other words, unless there's some kind of check on the standards for judging what constitutes success or not, uh, anything goes. And that's not consistent with the social justification of a university, which is, again, the pursuit of truth and the pursuit of knowledge. I understand that I'm overdrawing these distinctions, but that is the, I'm just trying to make a point. Uh, so, so, so that's, that's why I think that, that academic freedom has to be distinguished from freedom of speech. The, the yes, and I was just thinking of that when you were talking there, is yes. I Sorry. think, and this is, I'm just thinking, comparing your view with Mark Mercer's, hmm. it, it might be that you're not as far apart on this as I was thinking. Just because I think your distinction that you've made between the process and the product, like I think Mark is assuming that the, although there can be relativists and so on in the academy, that the, they would be people that would be pursuing relativism from a thinking it was, well, that's kind of the contradiction, I guess, yeah. is that they, they might be pursuing it in good faith like um and i don't quite because it's one of those strange things with relativism which i i still am trying to figure out how this happened which is the relativists became kind of absolutists hmm. like there was a turn so it started off with a relativistic kind of thing and then that got turned into this dogmatic imposition which the dogmatic imposition is inconsistent with the relativist kind of framework which makes me think that it was kind of a bad faith thing all along just to kind of get us on you know to to and in my own studies what i'm looking at is the um the the uh, how universities were transformed in the 1960s and the, and the 70s to incorporate these sort of advocacy kinds of programs, which had relativistic, um, th their, their epistemology was, was relativistic. Mm -hmm. And so that's when, when they got in there and they were allowed to be it because it kind of undermined the, the kind of universalistic kinds of ideas, it undermined that. Once they kind of got that, the, the, the legs knock from under things, then that enabled them to seize hold of the university because you had no standard with which to vet anything anymore. So it was a necessary, relativism was a necessary part of the power struggle that was happening whereby this whole entity now has seized hold of the university. But it's strange how it, it went from the relativistic kinds of thing that got it in there to then becoming the, the dogmatic imposition, which now is pushing out anyone who insists upon the pursuit of truth. So the people who are insisting upon the pursuit of truth now in universities are being pushed out. That, that's what's going on. And, and I would argue that's what's happening in my case, although you know, there'd be obviously disputes about that, but like, if you're gonna be a person who's trying to uphold standards and everything like that in this particular climate, you are going to be pushed out as a as a hate monger and a and a and a discriminator and a harasser and all these kinds of things. 
So, yeah. Do you have any insights on that? That how that went from a relativistic kind of thing to the the kind of the the dogmatic. Uh, kind of totalitarian kind of character of this sort of movement? Yeah, I think of it as activism, not academia. So one of my annoyances is how people are characterized as academics in this, um, mm -hmm. when, when really it's a, it's a form of political activism. And if you look at it from that perspective, then the t techniques that are employed by cancel culture practitioners fit perfectly into that agenda, that, pr that program. Mm -hmm. so, so again, think about it. They're, they're you know, two ways. Uh, and again, I'm, you know, I'm overdrawing this, but just to make a point, if you're, if you're following the same basic set of ground rules, this sort of liberal enlightenment project uh, that like, uh, I'm thinking, for example, of uh, Jonathan Rosh's book, uh, The Constitution of Knowledge in Defense of Truth, this notion of a regulated marketplace of ideas that privileges things like merit, excellence, competition, but competition in the pursuit of the truth. Mm -hmm. So we try to overcome our confirmation biases uh, by subjecting our beliefs to critical scrutiny from others who disagree with us. And the outcome of that process, people who believe in this, uh, is that we're going to get closer to the truth. So if you think about that as one project, that, that's kind of like the Enlightenment project, mm -hmm. uh, the privileging of reason and the pursuit of truth through uh, regulated marketplace of ideas. That's different from the activist project that we get from the sort of later form of postmodernism. And there, what the activist is interested in is, again, these ideas that, that knowledge is socially constructed, and it's really determined on the basis of power dynamics. So you don't engage in rational discussion with those who you perceive as having a higher position in the power hierarchy. Instead, what you want to do is gain that power. And when you look at it from that perspective, you can see things like the, the limiting of rational discourse as fitting perfectly within that agenda. So if you think about safetyism, for example, mm. uh, cancel culture in general, they're, they're basically techniques to limit acceptable discourse. It, it's, it's, it's the project of the ideologue. It's, it's, that's what cancel culture is, as opposed to the rational pursuit of the truth there, there's a different set of rules that are being followed. So the things that people are upset about, things like academic mobbing, cancel culture, uh, safetyism, complaints about harassment and hate speech, uh, the privileging of felt ex or lived experience is the expression they use. These are all ways of limiting rational dialogue. And they fit perfectly into that model. Uh, where we're actually engaged in activism, we're not actually engaged in the academic project anymore. And the argument that I'm making is, when we see it for what it is, why is that protected by tenure? Why is that protected by academic freedom? Academic freedom as a value is justified by the extent to which it actually promotes the social benefits we get from pursuing truth and knowledge, not from subverting that. So just like I'm not free to yell fire in a crowded airport, or he's got a bomb in a crowded airport. My right to freedom of expression doesn't extend to the very subversion of the values that justify that right. Same thing in academics. Why would you think that a right to academic freedom licenses a political subversion of the very values that justify academic freedom in the first place? That's just nonsensical to me. I mean, mm -hmm. you have to be careful to draw the distinctions, but once you see the argument. Well, I think that your distinction that you've made uh, between the process and the product uh, is very helpful. And actually, Elizabeth Radda, I remember her talking about this a number of years ago. She's a New Zealand uh, political economist who came to Mount Royal. And she was really stressing this process thing as well. Um, and I think it's, a, it's kind of the mirror image for the uh, whatever the critical theory extremists or whatever words, woke element, etc., is that their product is closed so like they have a a preset product that they want and they demand an openness of the process to justify that product so whereas the academic has a very uh prescriptive idea about what the process is like it's a very set kind of way of doing it um and then whatever comes out of that is very open because it'll depend upon what the what what is determined by the process for the critical theory what you call the critical theory extremists it's the opposite 
So what is set is the, the vision of the world that is wanted, which for the critical theory extremists, that's kind of an interesting question is what is the, the vision? Well, it seems to be um, the people who used to be on the bottom are now gonna be on the top in the future. And everything in the process has got to be shifted to make that happen. And of course, that just throws out science that's gone and uh, due process, you know, forget that. And, and uh, for viewers who are not familiar with this case, I'm not sure if you are saying, but I would think I told this to talk to you about, about a week ago, Evergreen State College. <laughs> Benjamin Boyce's documentary of 24 episodes on YouTube. That was for me was very disturbing because I could I could see the the whole kind of dynamic playing out. It just isn't as extreme in other cases, but that's sort of what was happening is that there was this kind of predetermined kind of idea that you had to sub subvert or whatever the word is going to be, but you had to allow the people perceived to be oppressed, to be the ones controlling everything. That was their vision. And that meant that all of the kinds of processes that we're talking about here that are very, very important for the maintenance of the academic institution were just destroyed. They were completely destroyed. And I think that Evergreen State College, that's the future for the university. That's where all the universities are going unless we take seriously this distinction that you're talking about here, which is we have to get these processes to conform to academic uh, intellectual types of interactions, which seems to be not existing anymore. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, th there's another case I was reading uh, from FIRE, the Foundation of Individual Rights and in Education in the United States of, um, a philosopher actually in the humanities department, not, not me, a different person in Maryland, uh, who was accused of um, harassment, I think it was, uh, for defending academic freedom at a department meeting and in another public forum uh, on, on their campus. And uh, one of the persons that he was interacting with claimed that his arguments was making her feel unsafe. And you can see how appeals to safety, harassment, <laughs> and safetyism, it really are designed to shut down any kind of discussion or debate. Yeah. Um, and so in, in that case, he was, I mean, I mean, again, just need to think a little bit more carefully here. So the notion that he was bullying her uh, or harassing her, it, if you think about it, bullying and intimidation are techniques that subvert autonomy. You can't bully somebody into being rationally persuaded. And again, that's just more evidence of this sort of appeal, like uh, the coddling of the American mind, uh, where Lukianoff and Haight, uh, sorry, Haidt talk about uh, the, the, the rise of safetyism in our culture. It's a perfect tool for somebody who's engaged in the late postmodernist activist agenda practice, because it's a way of shutting down a rational discussion. And it fits perfectly into that model. And the, the response to that, again, from the academic perspective is, you're an academic. Uh, you should be committed to a process of engaging in the regulated marketplace of ideas and you can't appeal or you shouldn't be able to appeal as a professional academic to the notion that you're intimidated by rational argumentation. Um, it, I, ideally, if I have bad views, I would appreciate somebody criticizing them so I can have better views. Um, to internalize it as a kind of threat to my safety is just a subversion of the idea of real concerns about safety. But that's really uh, in the domain of the disputation of ideas. But again, you can see that, that that fits perfectly within that frame. Again, another example is people who appeal to their lived experience as a way of trying to shut, up, shut down debate. There is a role for appeals to lived experience in a whole range of questions, but it's, it's not the final word or the only word. And again, typically when people appeal to that, they're trying to shut down debate. Uh, they're trying, again, to subvert, whether intentionally or not, the process of rational disputation, you know, again, in that regulated marketplace of ideas. So, Francis, I think we've had a few years now to, uh, at least I have, to process, uh, think about, read, 
uh, about these practices. So in response to your pessimism, which I understand, my hope is that as we are better able to identify uh, the, the, the problem, uh, we'll be better positioned to try to uh, change things. Now, of course, reason is slow and hard work. Mm. Um, resist, people are not patient. Um, and that's a problem with instrumental rationality. And also we, uh, we're averse to work. So, you know, the defenders of reason have a tough road ahead of them. Uh, you know, I believe yeah. in, the, in the project, but we'll see how things yeah. turn out. Yeah. So uh, on that note, we reached the hour sync, so uh, Good. we can move on to what I like to call now evergreen light, oh, yes. <laughs> which is Mount Royal University and, uh, you know, all the stuff that's happening there, uh, which I have un uh, unfortunately too great a knowledge of, uh, but still, um, I, and again, I don't think that I'm pessimistic about the situation. Mm -hmm. I, I think that I, I, I want to sort of see it like Mark Mercer was saying that it's, you know, we should we should see it as, you know, it's not about winning the game. It's about playing the game. And so I just want to, you know, make sure that I play the game as as well as I can. I'm going to have to play it very, very well, obviously, mm -hmm. to get on top of this this absolute craziness that's going on. But um, but anyway, I'll, I'll turn it over to you so that you can. Uh, either cover things that we didn't cover or cover new things, uh, whatever you think is is best. Yeah, so I, I do want to give you a chance to, you know, to speak your mind on the topic, but <laughs> we were just talking about the topic of harassment and safetyism and concerns yeah. like, do you see any connections between those, you know, those strategies or those practices and what's happened to you as well? Maybe, I, I mean, I assume people who are viewing this are familiar with your story, but maybe you should... Um, Take a few minutes just to rehearse yeah. that. Yeah, maybe, maybe. You can situate yourself into the, you know, into this dynamic. Why don't you take yeah. some? Time to do that? Yeah. Um, yeah. So for people who are new to this conversation, there's a website that's been developed called wokeacademy.info that has now quite a lot of information about the various things that have happened, and um, I'm trying to kind of categorize. To, to kind of simplify it to, so that to, to get my head around what's gone on, there's definitely two types of two phases, I guess, definitely two distinct phases of the situation. One was the, the pre attempt to get me fired phase or the overt attempts to get me fired where I was asking questions. So I sort of knew that things were not heading, heading in a good direction. So what I thought would save me would be just whenever you would go into a contentious event with a, a critical theory extremist type of dynamic, um, most people don't even go to those things who are rational. Like that's kind of the problem is that there's a self-selecting thing that goes on. But because of my research on indigenous policy and it, its takeover by this kind of, what would be considered to be this woke critical theory extremist kind of element, I, I really, my whole future was was under threat. I, I realized that. And, and it, would, it had been going on the whole time I'd been in the university system. So it was nothing new. Um, but I, I felt the need to go to these events and, and, and I would ask questions at these events. And what was happening is that people were becoming more and more angry at the questions being asked. And it was sort of like I was a, a crank, like that's how it was being portrayed, but no one was really answering the questions. So I, I would never get the questions answered I would try to have follow-up questions. And this got being to, to become characterized as being relentless. So I was seen as being this relentless kind of crank who was going and continuously asking questions when it was basically determined that, you know, this is this product, like the, the product was what was the concern. And that was what had to be there, which was indigenization was the product. And, you just would have to allow any method, whatever method 
was going to be used to justify that. So that was kind of the first part, the first phase. The second phase was when I defended Wendy Mesley's reference to Pierre Valliere's book title, White Niggers of America. And the use of that, the mentioning of that word was seen as being just beyond the pale by about 40 faculty members. And they basically instigated this, this mob against me, which involved anonymous Twitter accounts and student. It was supposedly a student group, but it was, you never knew who, who was behind it. So it could have been anyone, um, but it was pretending to be a student group. So when I, uh, when this started to happen, then I, I started to become satirical in my approach. <laughs> Because I couldn't like this was kind of an interesting crossroads is, is I and it's like, how do you reason with people who don't accept reason like that? That's and I thought and I had kind of heard in various circles that satire is the way to deal with it because it exposes it, it, it brings a it brings a another kind of force into the whole type of type of you know interaction and Titania McGrath was my model which is the satirical character of Andrew Doyle and he would he was doing this very effectively with Titania McGrath so I turned my Twitter account into Francis McGrath and I just I took what was being said and I just exaggerated it slightly and then presented it back <laughs> but of course this enraged this enraged this group of people uh and that, that's when they really they really started to, like that's when i was targeted for, for dismissal so um anyway so that's kind of an interesting that tactic i'm, I'm still not quite sure <laughs> whether that was a good idea or i think it was because it exposed i i got to understand what the nature of the beast was much more before it was all kind of under the surface and you weren't quite sure what you were dealing with. When I started with the satire, everyone kind of came to the surface, everything came to the surface and it really allowed kind of who the critical theory extremists, who were the real hardcore critical theory extremists, woke element, who, who, who was the hardcore of this. So um, anyway, so when that happened, um, that's when I got hit with the harassment complaints was was because of the satirical kind of thing that I was doing on which I wasn't I wasn't doing anything that everyone else the woke element was was doing like they were doing a similar thing I was just exaggerating it but this was seen as being not allowed even though a whole bunch of people were doing much worse in terms of how they were going after me but it was it was again when you're making that distinction between process and product process one of the important things about process is the due process kind of idea and the woke element they don't they don't accept due process they they don't that that to them is seen as being a tool of the oppressor and they want to subvert that to become this if you're part of a particular group you're going to be given leniency in various things and you're going to come down hard on who's perceived to be the oppressor. And because I was seen as being the oppressor in terms of my positionality, that allowed the full weight of the anti-harassment kinds of policies to be brought down upon me. Whereas the people who uh, were, were kind of the instigators of everything, they were given a pass because they are part of the oppressed, perceived as being part of the oppressed kind of element. Um, so those are the two kinds of general phases, I think, that happened in my situation. And the second phase involves all these, what I call the weapons of wokeness, mm. which are the policies that are there to protect this, um, this kind of um, activism that's going on within the university. Well, lots of questions. Um, let me start with this one. Uh, so I'm curious about you know what you were trying to accomplish with the satire. So I, I despite what I was saying in the first hour, I was really just trying to draw some dis distinctions there. 
we find ourselves in this political climate. And my take on it is that, you know, people have different positions within the story, but there are a group of people who are just afraid. Uh, there are a group of people who are apathetic and they kind of withdraw. Um, there are a group of people who are obsequious. They, they want to fit in and they want the approval of people who are on the rise, at least within academia, who have positions of authority. Um, and personally, I'm skeptical about trying to change the minds of people who are in that extremist category. And I do think that they're, they're in a minority, that is the extremists, uh, the ideologues and the sub subversives, but that they, they punch above their weight in the sense that because of the I guess attitudes and behavior of other people who 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 are complicit or at least acquiesce in this, they appear to be stronger than they actually are. So personally, I, I'm not trying to convince the extremist ones. Um, it's the other ones that I'm trying to speak to. Uh, but what about for you? When you were when you moved into that second phase when you <laughs> the satire, were, were you trying to like you said you're trying to expose the extremist element? Who are you speaking to and what were you hoping to accomplish by doing that? Yeah, well, I certainly wasn't speaking to the extremists. Hmm. I, I was, I was, I guess, trying to show the world that I thought this was ridiculous. Hmm. Like, I, I just didn't want to give it any kind of credibility, uh, what was happening. And I did try for a number of, I guess it was weeks, to reason with, I remember one day after I had the the defense of Wendy Masley, when I just referred to the book title and and to the a quote a quotation mark a quotation in Wikipedia, which was um, the, the the Wikipedia article was on the subject quote unquote nigger, talking about what the word was, and I was just quote I was doing the same thing Wendy Masley had done. It was kind of interesting because now I'm looking back so I have more information now about how great like I, I thought that people would understand <laughs> that it's a book I don't understand how someone can tell another person that they can't refer to a book type I, I still think that is a totally crazy kind of position to have and and so I tried to argue with people and they just would say you're a racist and I'd go, well, how like are we gonna go through all the indexes and you know mark out, take all the book covers off? What what is you know, you're a racist? And they would just keep on saying you're a racist to me, like without any like would they would never, you know. So anyway, so I just kind of at that point, I kind of just thought I can't, I I think this is ridiculous. And so I started doing that sort of thing. And at the time, I thought that they would back off. <laughs> I thought if I exposed the, the craziness of it, and I was also identifying the people who were doing it as well. So mm -hmm. I was just circling their names and, and I was what I was doing at the time, I remember quite soon after I started doing this, telling these people, this is really good. I really think this is good because I know who are who the people are who are part of this kind of group now, and I've identified them, and I've publicized who they are. And I thought once those people started seeing their names being, you know, broadcast as people who were basically participating in this this mobbing effort that was going on, that they would that they would back off. Um, but they didn't, they, they were very, um, you know, they're very confident, very, very confident in their uh, position, I guess. Um, so it was, you know, it, it was a bit of an odd time because I was kind of, I was kind of acting in real time with not very much information initially. And, and I, it's kind of an interesting question if I know what I did, if I, if I knew what I know now, would I have done, you know, but it's like, is it impossible kind of, counterfactual because I was I was just kind of reacting like like that's what is kind of the most annoying thing about all of this that's happened is you know people are kind of acting as if I went out mm -hmm. and went after people 
when that's not what happened at all, uh, what happened was that, that like 40 people were going after me and I was trying to figure out how to, how to deal with this mob that was not rational and was not doing anything. So that's kind of how I just, and I, I, I just thought humor would be the way to kind of show that it was ridiculous and also that I wasn't going to be intimidated. I wasn't, I wasn't intimidated by what was going on. So that was sort of my, uh, what I was thinking at the time, but I, I, I guess I, I didn't really realize how bad things had, had become. Like I, I still was kind of operating within a mindset of how things used to be as opposed to how they were. Um, but it's certainly, you know, I think things, what happened to me was inevitable. It just happened more quickly. Uh, and, and it's probably more useful in some ways because it kind of encapsulated everything in a more compressed, a more kind of, you know, you can look at it in a more kind of complete package than if it had gone on for five years. Uh, it, it kind of, it turned like a five-year thing into, into about a year uh, that happened with the satire. Yeah, so so I mean you you you've spoken to this a little bit, but I know that when you're in the moment in some sort of unfamiliar or controversial uh, situation, you're just trying to process it at the time. But now that you're on the other side, you've had a chance to reflect a little bit about what's happened. Yeah. But is, is there anything else you've gained as far as insight into that process? Something that could benefit other people who might who might find themselves in a similar situation? Something to forewarn um, uh, to help others. Yeah, uh, it's it's it's. Uh, I don't mean to put you on the spot, Francis. No, like, but I I think there's things that I think about as well. I think one of the most important things is organization. That you that you need to have a big, a large, a very large support network, and even if you do have that, it's 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 not gonna. It might be unsuccessful. Um. So that's the first thing is that, you know, for people, and that's why I think all these organizations where we're at right now, that that's where the work has to be done is getting these organizations to be interconnected with one another. So it's not just a whole bunch of fragmented types of things, which is, is sort of where we're at now. We have a lot of very, very good organizations, but we're all kind of doing our separate things and not, we don't have a concerted action uh, that that is occurring so um so i think that that's the first thing what's really helped me a lot because i'm not although i'm 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 uh you know i things have not been easy that's for sure i i think about other people and how terrible things have been for them and it's because they became isolated right. uh, and and so they didn't really have anyone to connect with which has not been my situation the other kind of thing, which is an interesting work in progress, is um, how what is the what is what are the implications of publicizing information? Mm. That that's one of the most difficult questions that I'm faced with all the time. Mm. Um, and and what happens is that you you have, for example, the faculty association really encouraging you not to talk about your case hmm. and 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 we'll we won't know until everything gets goes through the pros the various processes but i think that's that's a huge mistake i think i think that's what gets you under the thumb and then people are able to control you and, and manipulate you and everything when things are secret. So I think one should try to make things as, as, as public as possible so that people can see what's happening and then eyes are on it. Um, and that's the big challenge right now is that um, I, wanna, I want the arbitration to be public, mm. which everyone is resisting. <laughs> mm. <laughs> because the Mount Royal certainly resisting it because uh, they want, there's a whole bunch of things they don't want to have come out. Um, the, the faculty association also was, was encouraging me not to, and, and like that's still in the works as to what's going to happen there, but I really want to push that to be, to be public. I have 
everything, I'm happy with everything that I have being made public. The only reason why I haven't made everything that I have public is because I'm afraid of, of uh, you know, breaching some kind of rule that then is going to, you know, have a serious consequence. So, you know, confidential information uh, uh, can't be released. But that's a very interesting question as to what actually is confidential information. Like Mount Royal will put confidential on top of everything. Then then they'll like they're kind of pretending that, you know, even though it's your, you know, Tim Raleigh's termination letter now, which is on the wokeacademy.info website, that's not confidential. Like that's that's confidential to protect me. That's the reason for the confidential, not because it's some other kind of wide process. Um, it becomes a bit more tricky when you're dealing with, um, you know, complaints that have been made against other people. So then that's now, okay, you can argue that's confidential, I guess. But any complaint that's been made about me, that shouldn't be, that should be, I should hold the privilege and that should be, that should be, that should be public as far as I'm concerned. I, I don't understand why someone's complaint about me should be should not be, you know, me, uh, the, the public is able to see that. So, so that's kind of what's going on now. And, and it's, it's all kind of murky and you don't want to make a mistake. And so you don't want to have, you know, do some kind of terrible thing that, that now you can't recover from, but it's not very clear. And, and you have a, a bit of a sense, and maybe this is unfair, that all the parties involved are, are kind of wanting to make it as murky as possible. Mm -hmm as a way of controlling what goes on. Although that, it, you know, it's hard to know. Lawyers generally tend to be very cautious about mm -hmm. things. And, and they'll say things like, uh, you know, you shouldn't talk about your case because anything that you say can be used against you in the arbitration. It's like, yeah. well, I don't think, <laughs> I'm not, you know, I, I'm going to just say what I think is true. Like, uh, you know, I, I, I can't see how me talking about something, which is a fact, but that's not what they're, I guess, part of it is too, you've got people who, who get really angry and then say a whole bunch of, you know, crazy things about people, you know, like that, that's a problem. But if you're just trying to state the facts of what's happened, I don't, I don't see why this should not be in the public domain, it just seems to be um, not very, you know, but there's, there's, there's a lot of control that's going on, uh, which is, and manipulation that's happening. Um, and then there's the faculty association, which is, is the most scary of all the things, hmm. because, you know, I, I've been involved in the faculty association for 13 years, and I, I was, I was always pro-union, I always wanted, hmm. thought the union was a good idea, um, a lot of people who get into these skirmishes, of course, are anti-union, which is whatever. But I, I was always, you know, a supporter of the union. But but the union has is got it's been captured a lot. A lot of it's been captured by this these these critical theory extremists, and so the the union does isn't really operating as a as a as an entity that is fairly representing people. Uh, so that that's a serious problem uh, for for anyone who's dealing with these things. So, um, and we'll see how that all works out, but, but that's a big kind of struggle that's going on. Um, so I think that's a few pieces of advice just to distill them, have as much public information as you can. Um, that's very important. Number two, develop strong linkages with different people who can advise you and that and people with different perspectives as well mm. um, and and you've talked about this in, in your own kind of criticisms of things is um, you want to avoid confirmation bias like you, you want to do the you want to proceed in the best possible way that you can and people often tend to surround themselves with like-minded -mind, thinkers and, and that could lead you down a really a path that's not that's not uh, uh, you know the most rational. The, the difficulty, of course, with 
having a bunch of diverse perspectives is that they don't agree with often don't agree with one another. We, so we lost the internet connection just for a moment there. Uh, and I'm not sure if it's mine that's unstable or, or yours. It looks like mine is, but maybe yours is fine. Maybe it was just on my end. Yeah, I, I think it was just on, I, as far as I know. But okay. um, but I, I, the two points I just wanted to stress were um, going as public as you can and two, having a supportive network of diverse viewpoints, which is not easy because you have to act. And if you have diverse viewpoints, then it can almost be paralyzing because yeah. you get contradictory positions, but the contradictory positions can help you think through the possible implications of what, of what can happen. So let me just pick up on this, um, this one dimension. So your case has become more of a public case. And I'm just thinking about it. Uh, from the perspective of somebody who doesn't know the background, uh, how would they react to say reading about this for the first time? So, so here's the here's how I I think of this. So we can't operate in our lives without some basic trust in our institutions. Um, you you can be a skeptic, but you can't be a skeptic about everything all the time. So the default that most people carry around is to have some basic faith in our institutions. So unfortunately, when you're in a position like yours, people will naturally assume, you alluded to this before, that if you're terminated, if your employment's terminated, you must be somehow culpable or some in some way culpable. And if the way that that argument goes, it seems to me, is it crucially depends on whether you've been, you've been subject to cancel culture forces or if there's a justification uh, for your treatment. So briefly, the distinction between cancel culture and rational persuasion is that cancel culture basically manipulates the information battlefield is the way that Rosh puts it. It, it. It's basically a form of political manipulation as opposed to appeal to reason. The way that one way that comes out in your situation, I think, Francis, are attempts to marginalize, which is a, you know, a characteristic of cancel culture as well, attempts to marginalize and undermine the expertise of people who are targeted for such treatment. And the way that comes out in yours, and unfortunately I'm not an expert in this area, so I can't really judge this, but, but I'm interested in your view about it. People who, under, who basically uh, cast dispersions on your scholarship, and what they try to say is that that falls outside the bounds of uh, professional academic expertise. And you can see how cancel culture gets rolling by having a group uh, that's the in-group that then decides what constitutes legitimate scholarship and can via that process uh, marginalize somebody. Uh, but apart from that, how do you respond to the argument that the, the things that you've been doing uh, have really fallen outside of the legitimate boundaries of academic expertise uh, that should be protected by uh, academic freedom? So people who make this case will say things like, uh, of course, we support academic freedom, but this isn't one of those cases because uh, she's engaging in conduct that's outside the protected sphere of what academics should do. And this is the consequence of that. If you stay in your lane, if you basically operate within your area of expertise, you don't have anything to worry about. How do you respond to uh, that? But those kinds of attempts to really marginalize and, and isolate and undermine uh, your, your position. So there's, there's quite a lot of facets to, mm -hmm. to that. And, and there's, there's sort of the two spheres, uh, two phases that come into play as well. The, the, the academic side, what would be called the quote unquote academic side, which was, um, uh, you know, my my books and my my arguments and so on about indigenous policy indigenization mm -hmm. um which has been claimed to be like for example the residential schools is probably the best example of this um that we don't allow holocaust people to teach ho holocaust denial in the university system as far as i know if if you're going to be denying the holocaust <coughs> uh you know, that, that, that kind of comes into what you were talking about, uh, which is the process. So 
let's say someone's using a process and then they come up to, to find out that the Holocaust, Holocaust was some kind of invention, you know, like they, they come, like, I can't see how that would possibly happen, but you know, if you're, you'd have to be looking at the process that they were, that they were using. Um, anyway, what's happened with the residential schools is people are trying to draw parallels between denying the Holocaust and denying that the residential schools were genocidal, which I think is a, is a, is like that to me is the incompetent comparison to be doing that. And one of the ways in which this was done was to use this kind of relativistic postmodern kind of viewpoint that you've got indigenous ways of knowing that just must be accepted because there's no truth anyway. And so we should just see them as being equally valid. And one of these ways of knowing was um, these knowledge keepers say that there's 215 children's bodies buried in the apple or the apple orchard in Kamloops. That's the knowledge keepers way of, you know, their, no, their <laughs> knowing is this, their way of knowing is they've spoken to the ancestors, they've got these memories, they've got this and that and everything. And then, you know, so the, the, the question for the academic would be, does that meet the, cri the criteria that you're talking about for the process to be mm -hmm. the, the rigorous process? And it's not mm -hmm. because um, memories, there's all these problems with memories, it's well-documented. People were in these very emotional contexts talking about these stories amongst one another for the last 20 years. And so they've kind of absorbed a lot of these kinds of lurid tales that are going on. Now it's still possible that there are bodies buried in the apple orchard, but we're, we can't just say, well, the knowledge keepers say it's so therefore we must accept it. That's not a rigorous mm -hmm. method. So what we need to do is go and excavate and see what's there. But of course that's not going to happen probably because then it's it's it goes against the political kind of current. So that's on the academic side, which is the people who are saying that I'm a Holocaust denier type of person are using processes which are not rigorous at all to make those kinds of claims and then portraying me as being the the kind of the the person going against the, the current. Uh, sort of thing so so i think from the bottom up all the processes to do with indigenous policy have been completely contaminated and corroded and don't exist anymore at all because of the indigenous ways of way of knowing kind of position which is which is rooted in that relativistic kind of position that came out of the the 60s and the 70s so that's that's the one side the other side is the satire and you know, people were saying, you know, some of my colleagues, you know, this is an academic freedom, you, you know, doing this satirical material and so on. Um, but I, I, and and my original thing was, well, this was just my freedom of express. Like I was not. That's how I originally sort of saw it. And and if we're going to see everyone's Twitter accounts as being held up to the rigor of the academic side, then we're gonna have like hundreds and thousands of academics all being hauled before, you know, whatever incompetent, you know, sort of, you know, tribunals trying to look at their competence and whatnot. Uh, mm -hmm. So I don't think that Twitter on your personal account, on your personal time, I think it's a freedom of expression issue, not an academic freedom issue. Um, but if I'm going to have to justify it, you know, I was trying to um, expose the contradictions of this critical theory extremism that was going on with respect to a number of issues. The residential schools were one of them. 
Um, but trans activism is another one, like where you have kind of very, very irrational things being talked about. And because the people who are putting them, putting these things forward are irrational and, and don't, and don't abide by, you know, logic, evidence, reason, having contradictory things put in the Twitter kind of short punchy it's a way of exposing the irrationality of it so mm -hmm. um i can defend it as a i think that my my tweets pack a lot of truth mm -hmm. in them uh and i do i do everything i do has a there's a reason for it i i construct it it's it's a it's on the basis of this weird twitter logic but I would I would sort of just copy what these irrational people were doing and then just make it a little bit more extreme to ex to kind of expose the uh, the irrationality of it. Uh, so I, I everything I can I can explain in detail why every single aspect of a tweet was put forward in the way that it was. Um, but that's I originally I hadn't really. I was doing it for the purpose, but I, I didn't think that it was going to be considered to be an area that would be judged according to academic standards, um, which I don't think. Like, I don't think that's how most people who are professors are using Twitter. Mm -hmm. And if we're going to insist that Twitter is going to be part of our work, which is what Mount Royal seems to be doing, we're going to have to get that down in policy in a much more clear way than exists right now, because most professors are not operating under that assumption, and they're using Twitter just as their own, you know, private kind of thing. Okay, let me pick up on the first part, and if we have time, the second part as well. Um, so again, looking at it from the perspective of somebody, say, who's just new to your case, mm -hmm. let's say, I'm thinking about this from the perspective of the interests of the average person. So I'm, I'm curious about your view about the negative impact of what's happened on, I, I don't want to make this overly grand, on society. So, mm -hmm. so <sighs> right now you're outside of the institutional support and acceptance that you enjoyed when you were employed and able freely to do your work and pursue your your uh, interest in your scholarship. So we often at least pay lip service in academics to the idea of tolerating views that we disagree with. And certainly people disagreed with your views. Mm -hmm. and I'm trying to get clear on that line. But what's your view about why it's bad for society? Uh, that that this kind of thing happens. It, it doesn't have to be just your case, but other cases as well. Yeah, uh, yeah. What do you see as the negative consequences? Why should the average person take an interest in your case? Why should they find what's happened alarming uh, or concerning? What do you what do you say to people who say, you know, they're, they're just privileged elites and <laughs> she probably got what was coming to her and you know, no skin off my nose, that sort of thing? How would you respond to that? Yeah, well, I think there's a number of different. Um, there, there, well, I guess there's two main main things. One is knowledge. So you know, and this is things that you were talking about in the first hour is that, um, you know, the reason why we have all these protections and everything in universities is is so that people have the freedom to kind of you know use these processes to come up with whatever result is going to come out of those processes. And then that, that result can be, can be used by all people to improve all sorts of aspects of, of, of the world. What's happened, and you can really see this with Indigenous policy, is that the, the quality of the, the product, if we're going to use that word, is very low, very, very low. And this is gonna have terrible consequences for society. Um, indigenous people 
the most it's going to be have the most neg- and that's what's so annoying about what's happened to me is that um there's been a whole bunch of colleagues at mount royal who have painted me as an anti-indigenous person when my research is actually very pro-indigenous because it is what is the truth it, it, it approximates the truth much more closely than the ideological types of things that are getting put out there and with that 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 quote unquote product that much more closely approximates the truth that has many more answers and how to deal with the terrible circumstances that exist within indigenous communities so from a policy standpoint you know we, we, we say and this is this was sort of the whole idea behind policy studies which was the area that i was uh you know housed at mount royal is in order to create policy that is effective you need to have the highest quality research po- uh, possible so that you can then kind of see what the implications are and what the data is upon which you're going to be, you know, sort of proceeding. But that has now all been completely um, submerged by all these political uh, types of considerations. So, you know, you have to come up with this answer and then you're going to have the um, the various processes rigged uh, so they can do that. So, you know, I think that is one of the major areas is the, the quality of knowledge which is coming out, which because of the, the kinds of controls that are now on people uh, in terms of the conclusions that they can reach, you know, you don't want to come up with what's considered to be the wrong answer because you're going to be pushed out. Um, and then we have the wider kinds of problems, you know, in the universities in terms of open inquiry. You know, this is really uh, this is a huge problem. You know, what is a university like when it's kind of understood what the official line should be and any deviation from that is going to result in punishment, not just for, for, for professors, but for students. Mm-hmm. You know, so there's a whole bunch of students now walking around who know very well that they better not say certain things. They're going to be punished for that. And so that's really kind of, you know, sort of, you know, kind of constraining what it is that students can do within the university. And then this is going to have much wider implications in terms of the ability for people within society to be able to have these kinds of conversations. So um, there's a lot of ripple effects that are going to happen because of this. and. Um, you know, people think, you know, uh, my personality or I didn't, you know, use words in the right ways or all, all these kinds of kind of form issues um, when, you know, I'm not going to be, I'm, I'm just the, I'm just at the, 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 the tip of the wave, you know, I'm, I'm, I, it, it, there's a huge collateral damage that is happening behind me that is not visible. I'm just very, I'm very visible. So I didn't, when I was being subjected to these various intimidation tactics, I didn't submit to them. I I in fact pressed forward harder. I pressed forward harder, which then, you know, brought even more of a reaction. So because it's sort of blown up into the public domain much more than other people's cases have, that doesn't, you know, like there's there's hundreds of cases mm. that just are, you never even hear about. And people who just suffer in silence and think, well, I'm just gonna live out the rest of my university career just not not saying the things that I I used to say. And 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 so people have got to kind of think about the the kind of environment that is going to be created both in the university and the wider society because of the kinds of the kind of constraints now that are on the ability of people to say what they think is true so a lot of things people think are are true are not being said and this is going to percolate throughout the entire society and we are going to be very very diminished in terms of the ideas that we have that we're able to discuss and 
and and we're not going to be able to figure anything out. Things are the, things are going to become more and more mysterious, and that's going to, of course, create more and more conditions for, you know, what's really at stake here, which is, you know, I think the looming totalitarianism that's that's coming, like like increasing autocratic kinds of processes and 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 that kind of type of society that is that is not far off i don't think it's i don't think it's that far away and so people have to wake up you know it's really frustrating dealing with people who just kind of say oh well it's a phase it's passing you know it's going to burn itself out it's not <laughs> it's 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 increasing in intensity and we are we have a serious fight uh, on our hands and people have to really stand up you know I, I you know it's the time is now to tackle it um and but of course we need the organization so that people can be have a certain amount of protection uh when they when they come up against it yeah so there's that iceberg effect that you're talking about you yeah. know just the visible edge of this but uh i was thinking well a number of thoughts but there's a, a nice piece in the Atlantic. I don't know if you saw it last month by Jonathan Haidt. Mm -hmm. uh, and he coined a, a nice term to describe this. He calls it structural stupidity. <laughs> His argument is that what we're seeing as a result of forces that limit dissent in education and in society more broadly uh, is the emergence of what he calls structural stupidity where individuals in a system may be just as critical and as sharp as they were before, but because of the chilling effect of the forces of cancel culture, they're not speaking up and they're not contradicting nonsense. And as a result, we're all gonna suffer for that. And there's a really good book that maybe has been written, but I'm not aware of, uh, identifying all the streams of research that are now not gonna be taken uh, because of people who are afraid uh, by, that by pursuing their job and, and inquiring into it, the truth and facts about the world, uh, we're just not going to benefit from that. So it's a, a sad thing. And the other thing you mentioned that I just wanted to pick up uh, with you as well, Francis, was the effect on our students. Um, as you know, we're both interested in the uh, effects of cancel culture on how students function in their in their education. And um, there's the, the studies from Heterodox Academy that I, I that I was talking about um, off camera before. Uh, that show, and you've just mentioned this as well, uh, all of the unknown cases of especially students who are highly vulnerable in the education system. Think about the, if you want to talk about social hierarchies and positions of power, the students mm. are at the bottom. Mm. Uh, their fear is that their ability to gain higher education will be undermined, compromised, or sacrificed. Uh, if they actually pursue uh, questions that they're interested in studying or, or topics or even entertaining ideas that they might not ultimately agree with. So there are a number of chilling examples of students being subjected to the imposition of codes of conduct, student codes of conduct that effectively function as uh, messages to the broader student community to stay in your lane, basically. I wonder if you just have any thoughts about how like you're also a teacher um, mm -hmm. uh, how you view the negative effects from this this cancel culture movement on students and our education like i, I mean personally i feel horrible for them uh, my job should be to encourage them to pursue their curiosities and entertain thoughts and ideas try them out in the classroom try them out in a forum a supportive but critical forum um, and that's that's basically how it should work. Anyways, enough about me. I, I wonder if you just had any thoughts about that. No, I think, and that's what's kind of, that's the other kind of terrible consequence of me getting fired is that, you know, I was kind of held up as, and I had a number of people who approached me when I got fired, who were just like completely devastated. Like I, <laughs> you know, like I obviously was, was the one suffering, the, but they were devastated on, just because they felt for many years, they kind of took solace in the fact that I was able to, you know, survive. Like I was surviving, you know, not having an easy time of it for many years, but I was able to do it and I was protected. And then when I got fired, it was like, 
this is now going to be, you know, and this is why, you know, my case, you know, I, I know it's me and it's, you know, et cetera. I have a vested interest in this, obviously. But if I lose this case, if I cannot stress enough for people who are listening, my I cannot lose. I can't lose it. If I lose this case, it's over, you know, because, you know, it really sort of says, and, and that's what's kind of the kind of horrible thing about Mount Royal's termination letter is, uh, for example, there was a, there's two parts of it. One was that members of the public had complained about me. And another one was that students had complained about me and, and the Students Association actually put out a press release denouncing me. Um, so I thought, is that now the standard? If, if, if a, there's a professor who says some things which are unpopular, which they think are true, and the public complains about them and the students complain about them, the Students Association, that means that that professor should be fired. Is that what is that what is going to now be the standard? And if that's going to be the standard, that means no one can really speak freely anymore because you can't rely upon the institution to defend you in uh, in in these disputes. And and I was reading one of your articles. I'm not sure which one it was, but it was about the the, the discussion that we had. Um, I guess it was in 2015 about the code of conduct mm -hmm. when you did that great presentation uh, before the provost of the time, Kathy Sheeler and, and Jeff Cash and the Dean of Arts. There's a huge kind of groundswell against the code of conduct that they were trying to impose because it said um, that we we had to, the, the reputation, we had to protect the reputation of the university. My termination letter, one of the reasons why I got fired was because an investigator had said that I had harmed the reputation of Mount Royal University. You know, so there's a lot of kind of precedent setting kinds of claims that are made as to why I got fired, which are gonna have, if that goes through, if that stands, it, it means that no professor is going to be able to feel protected by what used to exist, which used to be taken for granted, used to be taken for granted uh, in the university. So that's, and I think students, you know, I, I students seeing me be fired, like, how are they going to now think in terms of their in terms of their own ability to discuss ideas? Because I used to have, um, you know. A lot of discussions in my classes where we would it wouldn't be my perspective that I would be putting forward. I would be putting forward different kinds of um, viewpoints on a particular topic. Some of them which would be very contentious, and saying to students, "You're at university. You know this is the time to be able to explore those contentious viewpoints and not feel afraid that you're going to suffer consequences because of it." And then the professors that was trying to facilitate those kinds of conversations gets fired. <laughs> it's not a good, it's not a good kind of thing for people to see, either professors or students or whomever. And, and that's why I'm really hoping, uh, you know, you know, even people who don't like me and you know don't think that my ideas are 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 very, you know helpful or whatever or think I've got some kind of personality disorder whatever they're thinking which I don't think is very fair obviously um, in fact I think I've I've kind of kept my cool pretty well after being you know pursued by you know large numbers of people for many years but still you know occasionally I lose my temper or I, I you know do something which I don't think I should have done or whatever but you know that's kind of everyone but generally I try to have the the intellectual discussions about things um uh, you know, even the satirical stuff i think is you know pretty sophisticated mm -hmm. and you know in terms of twitter which is like the most toxic of all the the kinds of social media platforms there's a lot of uh 
there's a lot of meat to what it is that I'm doing, but I think it's going to be a massive chill unless there's a blowback, unless there's a, an uprising where people say, no, no, that was overreach. That shouldn't have been done. You know, we need to reinstate Widowson back at Mount Royal. If she's not reinstated, that's a terrible message to all the people who are trying to mob people and get them fired. You know, unless that happens, which hopefully it will, um, you know, universities are going to be in, in terrible, in terrible state, uh, you know, much worse than they were previously. Yeah, I'd like to ask you about uh, administration, but um, I, I learned this word, ochlocracy, which is basically rule by mob, um, which is what appeals to those what who is are- the word? What is the word? Ochlocracy? Ochlocracy? Yeah, O-C-H-L-O-C-R-A-C-Y. It's basically rule by mob. So the principle is each according to his threat advantage would be a principle of justice for the ochlocrat. Uh, um, and th that's really what people who are worried about the reputation are really trying to foster because a reputation obviously is constituted by the views of enlightened people, but also the views of unenlightened people. Yeah. And if they happen to be in the major majority, uh, then now what's going to happen in the university system is going to be dictated by the mob, uh, which, you know, we saw in the case, in your case, where something like 6,000 people signed this ridiculous letter. Yeah. Uh, uh, anyways, um, uh, connected to that, I just, I just, I just lost my train of thought for a second. But I just wanted to uh, note about that. Let me think about it just for a second. Yeah. So this is about the mob rule. And then in my own case, the mob was successful. Like at this time, they've been successful. And hopefully with the process, you know, but it's disturbing, uh, you know, people, as you mentioned, think, well, how could, you know, an, institu an institution like Mount Royal, she must have done something wrong in order for an institution to have acted in that way, you know? And that's kind of the most distressing thing is that the institutions are failing. They're not behaving the way that we expect institutions to behave. And I think this is, needs a serious, you know, revamping needs to happen. And that's, you know, that that will only, you know, hopefully with the arbitration and everything becoming public, you know, my case can be a bit of a, you know, sort of a learning experience that people can have. The final thing that I wanted to say is that there was a number of, of uh, reasons that was were, were given in my termination letter, which were very much out of Orwell's 1984, mm -hmm. uh, which were, you know, that I hadn't shown remorse, that I hadn't accepted responsibility, that, you know, I've done nothing wrong, mm -hmm. right? It's Mount Royal that has got to be showing remorse and accepting responsibility. You know, this is the thing is that, you know, the fact that I think I'm right and there's been no evidence presented, this is now seen as, you know, more, um, you know, support for why it is that I should be fired. It's just one of those totally bizarre kinds of authoritarian types of documents, which is kind of a bit of a symptom of, of where we're at currently in the existing university climate. I, I, let me ask this quick question. I, I mean, it's a big topic, but maybe you can give your thoughts for a moment. So I read in one of the reports that FIRE issued that last year, 27 prof professors uh, who had tenure were um, fired in uh, terminated in the United States um, compared to like zero 25 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the protections of tenure are obviously under threat. And yeah. I'm wondering, do you have any maybe final thoughts on the responsibility of university administrators in and uh, in, in their role? I'm, I'm not asking you to talk about your specific case, but just mm -hmm. in general, yeah. uh, what function should university administrators play in yeah. protecting the culture of, uh, you know, protection of academic freedom, freedom of, of expression. What do you think about that? Yeah, well, I think um, this is kind of one of the structural problems that's been, you know, occurring for a long time, which is, you know, the corporatization of the university and, and the fact that administrators used to be academics who would do their time 
And then once they finish their term, they go back to being a professor again. That is kind of gradually being uh, overrun by you know, these kind of professional administrators and the, the brand managers and the various kinds of diversocrats and everything like that that are filling up these positions now. So I think that's a, something really that needs some, some thought as well, which is you know, making it so that the that those who are at positions, especially uh, positions like provosts, which are the important academic administrators, should be, you know, high quality academics and, and go back into the, into the faculty once they've done their term. Um, so that, that, that's a big, uh, you know, but, but I think that the biggest problem, which I think something can be done about are the faculty associations. You know, if we can't actually have the faculty associations protecting academic values, what, how can we expect administrators to do it? Like, I think that, that, you know, until we sort of sort out our own house, get our own ho house in order, then it's, it, it, you know, it seems to me to be, that's an easier kind of realm to kind of go after is the faculty associations, which is not that hard. It just, well, it's hard because it requires mobilization of the faculty hmm. is that you have to get a slate of, you know, academic freedom supporting candidates and get the people to back them to fill the, the executive board positions. Uh, that's kind of what's needed in the future. And that's that's kind of where the real struggle has to happen, which, you know, the, the faculty associations have been taken over by activists, which is not which is not going to bode well for for the universities in the future. So, Sink, I think we've used up our um, Two no, hours we've gone through. We had a very, very interesting uh, first hour of all sorts of philosophical things, which I think is going to give the audience um, a lot of meat uh, to kind of think about. Um, but I just wanted to thank you very much for all your insights today. And I didn't, not just that, for all that you've done, I think you are doing a, a heroic. Uh, job of, of trying to maintain the university as an academic space um, at Mount Royal and, and throughout Canada through your writings in the Society for Academic Freedom and Scholarship newsletter. Thanks, uh, Francis, and thanks again for having me on. Um, I'm not sure what this is called, but thanks National for Feast Disputations. No, it's, a, it's like a podcast or a video. I think or so. I think it's, it would be considered to be a podcast, yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for having me on. and. Um, I'm obviously very uh, interested in seeing how this is going to unfold. I mean, your case in particular. So I'm glad that you had a chance to uh, express your views and uh, respond to some criticisms as well. And um, yeah, just thanks again for having me on and um, good luck with your, with your struggle. I mean, it's something that I think that a system that is grounded in any kind of defensible value uh, has to be able to tolerate views that are dissenting that people might not like, like you said. That's really the test of the strength and maturity of the system. And that's really what I think is at issue here, or at least that's one of the issues. So we'll see how it goes. Yep. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Okay. Take care.